right okay welcome everyone to my youtube channel ensure you subscribe and uh, ensure you like and you hit um the sub you subscribe and then you also uh turn on your notification bell so that every time i've got a presentation you'll be uh receiving the notification to say i'm presenting all right okay so without wasting much of the time um i'm going to uh, we are going to look at human anatomy so we'll be looking at uh, anatomy and physiology okay so um on our preamble or should i say the introduction we have um, anatomy and physiology it equips you with the knowledge about the structure and the function of the human body so anatomy there um it's a combination of two words. There is ana, that talks about, so here the ana, it talks about the structures. Then domi talks about, um, it's, it means to cut or rather to dissect. Then physiology talks about the function of these uh, body structures. So when you combine the two, you realize to say in anatomy, we focus so much on the structure, you name the structure, and you identify the location where the structure found is found. And then in physiology, we focus so much on the function of the very structure that you've uh, looked at. Okay, so the combination of the two it makes sense because it is um, it is better it is better you know the structure, and uh, once you know the structure. It becomes easier for you to understand the function of that particular structure all right okay so um, again the other thing that we'll look at is um, this knowledge of anatomy and physiology will help you to distinguish between the normal and abnormal structures and function of the human body so this is very much important because understanding anatomy it is going to help you and equip you to differentiate between uh, the normalities as well as the abnormalities that you're going to meet in uh, medicine or uh, in med uh, medicine and surgery or even in pathology. Okay, then anatomy will provide you with the basic foundation that you need uh, will help. Uh, to help the patients and appreciate the basic or the basis of heal, the heal health in general and diseases in particular. All right. Okay. So the general objective for this uh, lecture session, at the end of this session, you should have a general understanding of what human anatomy and physiology is all about and the basic terms that are used in anatomy and physiology. Okay. So let's look at our objective that we have. So the specific objective that we have for this session is that uh, at the end of this session, students should be able to define uh, the terms that are used in anatomy and physiology. Then also students should be able to describe the organization of the human body and also to describe the homeostasis of the body fluid as well as the electrolytes. Okay. All right, so let's look at the basic uh, uh, terminologies as well as the terms that are used in anatomy and physiology. So to start with, we have uh, cells. So cells, these are just the smallest functioning unit of the body. That is according to Wilson and Wa. That was uh, in 1996. So these are the two <coughs> um, anatomists, the one that came up with uh, the definition. They said to say they are grouped uh, together to form tissue. <clears throat> yeah, and this is very true. The group of uh, cells that are working together, performing uh, specific and similar functions, they form what we call tissues. So again, uh, tissues, according to the same um, ana anatomist, they define a tissue as in a tissue is just uh, the body tissue consists of a large number of cells and it is classified according to the size, shape, and function of the tissue. So this was also done by uh, Wilson and Wolf. That was in 19, 
96. Yeah. Okay. Then they also, uh, you need to understand that on the tissue there, we have uh, four types of tissue. We have the connective tissue, we have the muscle tissue, we have epithelial tissue, and the nerve tissue. Okay, then what are membranes? Membrane, these are sheets of epithelial tissue that covers the line, that covers or line the internal structure or a cavity. Okay, so this was um, what these guys uh, came up to say. A membrane is just a sheet of epithelial tissue. All right, okay. Then um, the other component is uh, an organ. What is an organ? An organ is the group of um, the body tissue that are organized together to, uh, to perform a particular function. Then system, we define system as a group of organs grouped together to perform a particular function which maintains the body metabolism and homeostasis. Right, okay. So that was just, um, then again, when you look at the organs that we have in the body, we have uh, varieties of organs. The heart is an organ, the lungs are organs. Then on the systems, we have about 11 systems, yeah. Then um, let's look at the anatomical position. So it's very much important for you to understand the anatomical position. So what are these anatomical position? Anatomical position, this is the position of the body when it is in an upright, when the body is in, it is in an upright position. So in the bodies in an up or in an upright position, you realize that uh, <clears throat> the head will be facing forward, the arms at the sides of the thumb, and then the hands are facing forward. Then the feet are together. All right. So that's the anatomical position. Then it is assumed in all anatomical description to ensure. Uh, accuracy and consistency. Okay, so when you are describing it anatomically, for these positions, they need to be in the, the the anatomical order as stipulated above, where the head should face forward and then the palms on the lateral aspect of the body, so they should also face forward. Okay, so also look at other terminologies such as median plane. What is a median plane? Median plane, this describes an anatomical position whereby the body is divided into long, uh, longitudinal. Um, when the body is divided in longitudinal, you realize to say it is going to demarcate and separate uh, into the right as well as the left halves. Okay, so for you to be to, to tell or to say that this is uh, it's on the left part and the other part is uh, the other anatomical structure is on the right side we use the median plane okay then we also have what we call the medial and the lateral when we say medial we leave it to any structure that is near to the midline of the body i'll give an example the nose is medial to the eye and then i'll say when i use lateral so medial, it is structures that are near to the midline. Yeah, structures that are near to the midline, those are what we term as a medial. Then lateral, we leave it to structures that is far from the midline or at the sides of the body. I'll give an example to say um, the eyes are lateral to the nose. Then again, if I tell you to describe the anatomical relationship between the radial bone as well as the ulna you realize that um, the ulna lies medial the ulna is medial to the to the to the radial bone or we can say the radial bone is lateral to the ulna why because the radial bone is uh, it is found uh, away from the uh, the midline of the body and then the the ulna it is found just near to the midline of the body so in such term we use words such as uh, medial all 
right. Then we have proximal and distal. So proximal and distal, what is the distinction between the two? So on proximal, we usually we mainly talk about these are the terms that I use to describe describing the bones of the limbs. That is the proximal end of the bone, and um, the bone is the one that is near to the the point of attachment of the limbs. So something that we call proximal end, it is something that is near to the limb or rather the trunk. Then when we say distal, it is something that is uh, at the end or should I say it is further away from the point of attachment of the limbs. So that's how it goes. Then we have anterior as well as ventral. So anterior and ventral, in here, what we, uh, when we say anterior, it indicates part of the body that are being described to say it is nearer to the flant or they are found on the flant part of the body. So such kind of uh, the body parts, we usually call them as in anterior. So the other name for anterior, it's, it is uh, known as in ventral. Then posterior, the other name for posterior is dorsal or dorsal. This talks about, this is just the mean, it, 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 uh, this means that the body parts that are being described near to the back of the body. So all the body structures that are found on the back, we usually use words such as posterior or dorsal. All right, or dos, uh, dorsal or dorsal. Okay. Then, um... We have superior, so superior indicates structures that are near nearer to the head, to the head, that is superior. And then inferior indicates structures that are, are far away from the head. I'll give you an example to say the thorax, it is superior to the pelvis. Or should I say uh, the pelvis is inferior to the thorax. Or we can say the head is superior to the abdomen. Or we can say the abdomen lies inferiorly to the, to the head. Then we have borders. So borders, uh, we, we define borders as in a ridge of a bone which separates the two surfaces. So such is what we call as in uh, borders. Okay. Then we have the spine as well as the spinous process of, or, 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 or crest. This is a sharp ridge of a bone. So a bone has got a sharp ridge. Something that is sharper is what we call a sharp ridge of the bone. So this is what we call as in the spine or rather the spinous process or a crest, which is just a sharp ridge of a bone. Okay. So let's look at the closed anatomical position. So this is the closed anatomical position that we can see here. We have the man standing here and we have the woman standing uh, beside. Okay, so this is the exactly anatomical position. So anatomical position that depicts a, a male as well as the female uh, body planes. So if you look at um, um, the way a man is standing here, the, the head is facing forward. Then the, uh, the, 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 the hands, they are on the lateral sides. And then the palm are also facing forward. Then the feet are closed. They are also, the feet are together uh, facing forward with the, uh, the, to, uh, the toes. Then when you look at this uh, female here, the female plane, this is where now the anatomical a plain position are depicted from the female. So we have what we call the uh, the uh, the coronal plane, as well as the sagittal plane. So you need to realize to you need to remember that these planes, what they do is that they separate they separate um, the uh, they separate the position in which a person uh, is uh, is uh, positioned. Like for example. We have sagittal. So the sagittal is the one that usually cuts into forming the left and the right. Then the chrono, it is the one that usually cuts 
like it forms anterior and posterior. So for the coronal plane, this is where we have anterior or posterior, or should I say ventral or dorsal. Then on um, the uh, sagittal part, it's the one that separates the right as well as uh, the left. So it separates the right and uh, the left anatomical side. Okay, now co uh, continuation with um, the, the definition and the basic terminology. So we have what we call the trochanter or tubulosity or even uh, and tubercles. So trochanter, tubulosity and tubercles, these are just a rough bone projection which, which attaches a muscle and a ligament. Okay, and these have got uh, different names that refers to the size of uh, the projection. Okay, then trochanters, what are they? So trochanters, these are just the largest and tubercles that are smallest. Okay, then uh, the, uh, the, the tyloid process, tyloid process, this is just a sharp uh, downward projection of a bone that gives an attachment to a muscle. Okay, so those are what we call the tyroid process. Then we have what we call a fossa. A fossa is just a narrow depression, like something that has like a depression that forms what we call a fossa. So you're going to see these um, fossas when uh, we go to the human skeleton as I uh, show you the way the bones are attached to the, the, the anatomical limbs of the human being. Okay, so then we have the foramen. So the foramen is a wall or rather an opening in any structure of the body, such as what we call as in a foramen, a hole or an opening in any structure of the body. Then we have what we call the bone sinus. Bone sinus, this is an arrow cavity within a bone. So something that has got an arrow in it, that is what we call an oral cavity, like uh, uh, a bone a sinus. So a bone si sinus, it has an an oral cavity within a bone. Then we have meatus. The meatus, it is a tube-shaped cavity within a, uh, within a bone. So if a bone has got a t that tube that is found, a tube-shaped cavity within a bone, is what we call as a meatus. Okay, then we have articulation. Articulation is where something is starting or something is uh, um, like uh, beginning from. Like articulation, this is just, uh, articulation is a joint between two or more bones. So we can say when a bone, like for example, we can uh, look at the elbow, uh, the elbow joint so when you look at the, uh, the elbow joint we have the hauna the hauna the one that lies medial then the radius that lies lateral they form together with the humerus forming an elbow joint so this one is what we can call as in an articulation then what are sutures sutures is the name that is given to an immovable joint so the immovable joint, remember we've got two types of joints. We've got those that are movable and those that are immovable. So immovable uh, joints, like an example, I can give you the cranial joint, the one that is found on the skull. That one is this got uh, sutures. Okay, the names that are given based on the location. We've got the frontal occipital. Uh, we also have the posterior aspect. Yeah, and what not. Then we also have um, the mass, uh, the the mastoid, a bone within the lateral side of uh, the human brain. So I'm going to show you as I uh, as we go on um, looking at uh, the human skeleton. Okay. Then articulating surfaces. What what are articulating surfaces? This is the point. This is the part of the bone which enters into the foramen of a joint. So articulation surface is just a part of the bone that enters into the foramen of a joint. That is what we call 
um, the, art, uh, the articulation surface. Then we have what we call the facet. A facet, this is a small or generally rather flat articulating surface. That one is what we call as in a facet. All right. Then we have the condyla. So condyla, it is a smooth rounded projection that is found at the end of the bone, which is a part of a joint. So we've got also the condyla even on our helper joint. So in the lateral side, we can find these, uh, the condyla, like they are found on the, the rounded projection that are found at the end of the, uh, the, the, the bone, which forms, a, which is just a part of a joint, yeah. Then we have a septum. The septum, this is the petition, the petition separa uh, separating the two cavities. So a septum injury separates two cavities. Then we have a fissure or cleft. Fissure or cleft, this is, um, it is what we call as an uh, enalo slit. It is also known as enalo slit. Okay, so this is what we call then analysis slit. Now, quickly let's look at the organization of the human body. How is the human body organized? Okay, so the human body consists of trillions, uh, trillions of atoms arranged in a specific way and thousands of uh, chemical reactions that proceed in a very, uh, in a very timely manner. Okay. So these trillions of uh, atoms, they are the one that groups up and then forming um, molecules and molecules from there we get to have a cells. So the human body is um, organized in different structural levels of increasing uh, compre uh, compre uh, compressity. So it is so complex. So when we say complex, it simply means to say it has a lot of things like a vast a huge numbers of cells as well as the atoms that forms the whole entire organism. Yes. Then each each higher level is incorporate. Uh, each higher level incorporates the structure and the function of the previous level, which is very true, because the group of cells will make tissue, and group of tissues will also make organs. Group of organs will also make. Uh, systems and the group of systems also make now an organ system which is just an organism like you and I. So it starts from the lowest level which are the atom, molecules and compounds then proceed to form cells, tissue, organs and systems then finally an organism. Now the purpose of this section is to enable you to gain an understanding of anatomy and physiology with an emphasis on normal body structure and its function. Okay, so this was uh, according to Scanlon and uh, uh, Sanders. All right, so from here we'll look at the levels of organization. So in the levels of organization, we have what we call um, the level of organization we have, um, it starts with the atoms. Atoms, when the atoms combine together, they form molecules. And when molecules combine together, they interact and form cells. And these cells, they combine together, forming similar and specific function, forming tissue. And this tissue, they combine and work together, forming organs. These organs, they work, uh, work together and interact, forming what we call the body systems. And these body systems will combine and work together, forming the whole entire organism. So a person like you, you are made up of all these elements. And each level of structural organism that makes up a human body. All right, let's look at the body system and the designs. As you can see from the structural organization of the uh, human body, 
The body systems are the highest and the most complex levels. A system is an organization of varying numbers and kind of organ which together perform a complex function for a body. Okay. Then, let's look at these, uh, the body systems. Okay, so they are about, okay, they are 11, not 10. There are 11 major systems of the human body. These are, we have the nervous system, endocrine system, cardiovascular system, cardiovascular system, and uh, lymphatic system, and also uh, respiratory system, digestive system, skeletal system, muscular system, urinary system, reproductive system, as well as integumentary system, the one that governs the, the skin, the skin structure. Okay. Now, let's look at the, the main cavities that the body consists of. So, organs that makes up the organ, the organs that makes up the system of the body are contained in four cavities. They are contained in four cavities. These are, we have the cranial cavity that is found in the cranial, that is the skull. We have the thoracic cavity that is found in the thorax. We have the abdominal cavity that is found in the abdomen. Then we have the pelvic cavity that is found in the pelvic. All right, so let's start by looking at the anatomical description of these cavities. Okay, so as you can see on the structure that we have here, you realize that, um, you realize and you're going to appreciate that the upper part of the, the brain here is what makes up the cranial cavity. Then when we go on the thorax, this is where the thoracic cavity is. Then when we go inferior to the, th uh, the thorax, we have the abdominal cavity. Then again, below the abdominal cavity, it is the pelvic uh, cavity. Okay. Now, what is the anatomical description of the cranial cavity? So the cranial cavity contains, it really contains the brain and its boundaries are formed by the bone of the skull. And these anatomical boundaries are, so this is how the description should be. So as you are describing these anatomical structures, remember what I said earlier on. I said that anatomy talks about the body structure where they are found and how you can describe them. Then physiology talks about now the functions of those structures. So let's, look, let's start with the cranial cavity. Where is it found? So the cranial cavity just contains the brain and its boundary, which is the bones of the skull. So anterior, on the anterior part, we have one frontal bone. Then on the lateral side, we have two temporal bones, and then on the posteriorly, or rather the dorsal, we have one occipital bone, then superiorly, we have two parietal bone, and inferiorly, we have one sigmoid, we have one sigmoid, and one ethmoid bone, and part of the flantal, as well as the temporal and occipital bones. Okay. So that was just about the cranial cavity and everything that you need to know. So now we are on the uh, thoracic, uh, thoracic cavity. So the thoracic cavity is the cavity that is found in the thorax. So this cavity is situated in the upper part of the trunk, that is uh, the upper extremity or rather the upper limbs. Its boundaries are formed by the following bone uh, framework and supporting uh, muscles. Okay, so anteriorly we have the sternum, so on the thorax. Of course, on, when you look at on the anterior aspect, that's the, uh, the ventral, we have the sternum, we have the costal cartridge of the ribs, then on the lateral side we have the 12 pairs of the ribs and the intercostal muscles. 
Then posteriorly, or rather dorsal, we have the thoracic vertebra and the inter vertebra, the intervertebral disc between the body of the vertebrae. Then superiorly, we have what we call, so in the superior part of the thora, uh, thoracic cavity, we have structures forming the roots of the neck. Then inferiorly, we have now the diaphragm, a dome-shaped muscle. Okay. All right, okay. Then let's look at the organs. The organs and structures that are found in the thoracic cavity. So the organs that are found in the thoracic cavity, we have the, the main organ and structures contained in the thoracic cavity are, we have the trachea, two bronchi, and two lungs. These are the structures that forms the respiratory system. Then we have the heart, the iota, the superior and inferior vena cava. Then we've got the numerous of other blood vessels. Then we also have the esophagus. The esophagus, these are the organs that are found within the thoracic cavity. Okay, let's look at the abdominal cavity. The abdominal cavity, it is the largest cavity in the body and it is the oval, it is oval in shape and it's, it is uh, situated in the main part of the trunk and its boundaries are so when we go on the abdomen you realize that anteriorly we have the diaphragm which separates it from the thoracic cavity then anterior anteriorly we have the muscle the, um, the muscles forming the anterior abdominal walls then posteriorly we have the lumbar vertebra and the muscles that forms the posterior abdominal wall. So on the posterior, the dorsal part, the muscles that we get to find there, this is where you find the tissimus dorsi and other muscles that are uh, that are found on the, the dorsal part of the body. Then laterally, we have the lower ribs and the part of the muscles of the abdominal wall. Then inferiorly you have the pelvic cavity with, uh, with which it is um, con uh, continuous. Okay. Then as the loo of the abdomen, it is divided in nine regions and it facilitates the description of the position of the organ and structures in the cavity. So we are going to look at these nine regions and now the abdomen forms what we call quadrants. Okay, so most of the spaces that are found in the abdominal cavity, uh, the abdominal cavity is occupied by organs and the glands involved in the digestion, absorption, involved in digestion and absorption of food. And this includes the stomach, the small intestine, and most of the large intestine, the liver, the gallbladder, the bowel duct, as well as the pancreas. Alright, so this is a very good structure that uh, shows and exposes the abdominal cavity and its content. So the abdominal cavity, it has uh, the liver, where you can, say, you can see the cut edge of the diaphragm here, that is uh, anteriorly. Then we have the liver here. We have the, the gallbladder, we have the part of the omentum that is cut, okay? Then we have the ascending colons, so these are the large intestine. Then we have uh, the chasm, then we also have the appendix. Then we have the stomach on the other side there. The stomach is in a J shape. Then it has got the lesser curvature, then the greater curvature. So that's the blood tributaries that forms the part that distribute the blood um, blood supply to the stomach. And then it forms what we call an arterial anastomosis. Then we have the spring on the other side, this side. Then we have the transverse colon, 
then we have the descending colon then we have small intestine which are found in there okay so all these are part of the abdominal cavity then we have the pelvic cavity so the pelvic cavity it is roughly funnel shaped and extends from the lower end of the abdominal cavity and the boundaries are superiorly it is um, the continuation the continuous with the abdominal cavity that is on the superior aspect anteriorly it is the pubic bone then posteriorly it is the sacrum as well as the coccyx then lateral laterally it is uh, the uh, the ino, uh, the ino, the innominate bones so laterally we have the innominate bones then inferiorly we have muscles of the pelvic uh, that forms the pelvic floor All right then let's look at the organs and structures that are found in the pelvic cavity so the pelvic cavity contains the following organs and structure it contains the sigmoid colon the rectum anus also some loops of the small intestine the urinary bladder the lower part of the uterus and the urethra in female the organ of the reproductive system we have the uterus the uterine tube ovaries and the vagina in males some of the organs of uh, the reproductive system that includes the prostate gland and the semi the seminal vesicles then also the uh, spermatic cords that are the the different duct uh, the different duct which is also known as the vast difference difference then we also have the ejaculatory duct and the urethra that is um, common to the reproductive system the reproductive as well as the urinary system yeah so these are the part of um, the structures that, are, that you get to find in the pelvic uh, cavity now let's look at the beautiful regions and the wonderful regions that are found on the abdomen so these are the nine regions that makes up the abdomen the abdomen we have this side we have the right hypochondriac region on the right side then on the middle we have epigastric region then on the left side we have what we call the left hypochondriac region then we have the right lumbar region then on the middle we have the umbilical region then on the left side we have the left lumbar region then down which is uh, the inferior we have this part is called the right iliac region then the middle part is what forms the hypogastric region then this side forms the left iliac region okay so let's look at the cells what are cells all living or all living organisms are made up of cells and cell products so cells are just the smallest living unit of the human body so human body develops uh, from a single cell known as a zygote remember this zygote it forms uh, when we look at the component of anatomy that covers embryology where the stages of uh, uh, the growth development uh, begins from so it results from the fusion of the ovum that is the female egg and the spermato uh, spermatozoon that is the male sperm cell so these cells multiply and follow they multiply and as the fetus grows what happens is that the cell with uh, it is going it, it, the cells with different structures as well as the function specialization it will develop and then we we'll have what we call the genetic makeup of the zygote then individual cells are too small to be seen with our naked eyes so we usually use the microscope however they can be seen when the the thin sliced of the tissues are stained in the lab and magnified by the 
by the lens. So this one is mainly done in uh, histology, where tissue there is tissue um, there is tissue stain where you stain the tissue so that you get to see and appreciate these um, individual cell slides. The, uh, the ones that you, you cannot see with, you cannot see them with uh, the naked eyes, but you can see them with um, the microscope once the sample slides are stained. Okay, despite there are many differences, a human cell has several distinct structure features. A cell consists of a plasma membrane inside the are numbers of organelles. What are organelles? Organelles, these are just uh, bound structures, like the bound structures are what we call as an organelle. These are membrane bound structures, such as mitochondria and um, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus. And, uh, and so on and so forth, as well as the nucleus, it has those uh, those things, as in organelles. Okay, so organelles protein in the watery fluid that is called cytoso. So cytoso is just a, a, a jelly-like fluid, the one, the one that holds these organs within the, the cells. So organelles are small structures with high specialized function, many of which are contained are contained with uh, the membrane, and these includes the nucleus, mitochondria, ribosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, rhizosomes, microfilament, as well as microtubercles. So this is the, the detailed structure of the cell. This is the detailed structure of the cell. So we have the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which are there. Then these that you can see here, these are the ribosomes. Then this part is the nucleus, and this is the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now you can notice the difference. These that are smooth, they don't have ribosomes that are attached to them. And these that are rough, they've got ribosomes that are attached to them. And remember, ribosomes, they help in protein synthesis. Then we have the Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is the one that helps in packaging as well as modification of protein. Then you've got the secretory uh, granular or granule, excuse. Then we have the mitochondria, which is just the powers of the cell, the site where respiration occur. And this is where now the, the tricarboxylic acid cycle mainly occur or the Krebs cycle generates from. Like this is where you appreciate it the most when you cover this component in biochemistry, where you find to say that um, within the mitochondria, when all the conversion of um, metabolism, when Proteins are broken down to form amino acids, and then from there we get to have pyruvate. The fatty acids are broken down to form the key fatty acids, and from there we have pyruvate. <clears throat> then also the carbohydrates are broken down to form what we call as in glucose, and then glucose undergo the process called glycolysis that allows the conversion of glucose to form pyruvate. Now, pyruvate is an insoluble molecule that cannot enter the matrix of the mitochondria. Hence, it has to be converted to form acetyl CoA by the enzyme called pyruvate dehydrogenase. Then, acetyl CoA is the one that becomes permeable to the matrix of the mitochondria. Hence, it leaves the cytosol and enters into the matrix of the mitochondria, where it, you've, where it's, it is going to initiate the reaction, the conversion of oxaloacetate to form citrate by the help of an enzyme called citrate synthase. Then citrate, synth citrate will be converted to form uh, cis-citrate by the enzyme called aconitase. Then cis-citrate will be converted to form isocitrate by the enzyme called, uh, the same enzyme, aconitase. 
then isocitrate will be converted to form alpha ketoglutarate by the enzyme called isocitrate dehydrogenase. Then alpha ketoglutarate will be converted to form succinyl CoA. Remember, succinyl CoA it is the one that comes now in the the heme metabolism that is under porphyrin metabolism, where you find to say succinyl CoA reacts with glycine to form the otaminolevrunic acid, then it escapes the matrix of the mitochondria. So from there, succinyl CoA will be converted to form uh, succinate. Then succinate is going to be converted to form fumarate. <clears throat> then fumarate finally forms malate. Then malate forms of zero acetate. <clears throat> so this is all these structures. These are the biochemical structure uh, reaction that occurs within the cell. Now let's start with the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane. The other name for the plasma membrane is the cell membrane. Every cell in the body is enclosed by a cell membrane or the plasma membrane. It separates the extracellular from the intracellular. Now, you need to, rem you need to know to say that when we talk about extracellular, we are talking about structures that are found outside the cell. Then intracellular, we are talking about things that are found inside the cells. Okay. And it maintains the integrity of the cell and controls the passage of materials in and out of the cell. So it is a semi-permeable. What does it mean? Meaning that it regulates what enters and exits the cell. So that's a good part. It's a semi-permeable or we can say it is a selective permeable membrane that allows certain substance to enter and exit the cell. So all materials within the cells have an access to the cell membrane for the needed exchange okay so the plasma membrane consists of what we call the phospholipid so this is the combination of the phosphate as well as the lipid forming phospholipid then it has cholesterol it has also protein okay so the phospholipids form what we call a double layer of the membrane and it makes up the most of the membrane and only and the, and only permits what we call the lipid soluble material to enter and leave the cell by diffusion through the cell membrane. So the presence of the the presence of cholesterol decreases the fluidity of the membrane, thus making it more stable. All right, so that's that, that that's good. So have you seen the cholesterol that is found inside the membrane? What it does is that it decreases the fluidity in the membrane. So meaning that it will make the membrane now to become more stable. Okay. So the proteins have several functions. So uh, to form uh, the channel that permits, uh, that permits the passage of materials such as water and ion. So in here, this is where we get to have the sodium potassium gated channels and all those um, electrolytes so that a cell can be able to communicate with the other neighboring cells. So others are carriers, others are carrier enzymes that also helps in substance to enter and leave the cell. Then still other proteins are antigens. So other proteins are just antigens or makers that identify cells of an individual as himself. Remember, in antigens, this one you learn it um, in microbiology, where we tend to look at uh, the complement system, uh, the, comp the complementary system, where we have these the antibodies as well as uh, uh, the antigens, and it is also found on immunity what immunity is and what not yeah so these ones the antigens they are the one that helps to identify cells which they I, themselves identify as in cell as in individuals in self cells okay so well other groups of protein serves as receptor for hormone many hormones brings brings about their specific effects by the first bonding to the receptor on the protein membrane okay 
then we have um, phospholipids now the phospholipid the phosphate and the lipids that, uh, that attach together forming phospholipid molecules they have the head which is electrically charged and it is hydrophilic so hydrophilic means water loving so something that loves water is hydrophilic that means water loving so these heads they love water very much then the tails they've got a negative charge and they are hydrophobic meaning that they are water hating they are water fearing so if someone is fearing water they become hydrophobic Water lovers, it's hydrophilic. Yeah, so that's how it goes. Then phospholipid bilayer are arranged like a sandwich. The hydrophilic heads that are facing uh, the out surface of the membrane and the non-electrically uh, non uh, charged uh, hydrophobic, the tails forming what we call a central water repairing layer facing their in between the membrane all right so this is how the plasma membrane looks like it's just that this the picture is not that clear but it has uh, the phospholipid as you can see then it has got this channel to allow certain substance to pass especially ions and minerals okay so i'll show you a proper structure for a plasma membrane <clears throat> so plasma membrane continuation this is how it looks like so these are the heads that i was talking about so the heads are positive charges hence they are called hydrophilic meaning that they're water loving then the tails are negative i've got a negative charge hence they are termed as in hydrophobic meaning that the water hating or water fearing okay now let's look at the nucleus with the exception of the uh, of the matured red blood cells okay so the nucleus this one when the red blood cells are just forming what happens is this when the red blood cells are produced by the process known as erythropoiesis which is the process by which red blood cells are produced by the hormone that triggers the stimulation of the red blood cell production which is erythropoietin hormone that is produced by the kidney so what usually happens is that uh, erythropoietin hormone it triggers the process called erythropoiesis, which is just the formation of the erythrocytes, which are just the red blood cells. Now, when these red blood cells are formed, what happens is that they usually come with the nucleus, but when these cells matures, the nucleus disappears and it is repressed with hemoglobin. Then the hemoglobin contains the iron content that increases the affinity. For it to bind to oxygen okay so all human cells have nucleus expect except the mature red blood cells so it is found within the cytoplasm and it is bounded by the double layered nuclear membrane with many poles then it contains one or more nucleolus and the chromosomes of the cells there we have the thread of the chromatin which is uh, in the nucleus that contains the dna which is the deoxyribox ribonucleic acid the deoxyribonucleic acid that is the dna and uh, the genetic material of the cells that forms the genes and also the information uh, for the formation of the the, the protein that is uh, under the ribosomal rna okay then the nucleus as well as the nucleolus the nucleus determines how the cell will function remember it's the one that control the cellular activity as well as the function basis of the structure of that cell then the nucleus is a small sphere that uh, a nucleus is a small sphere made of uh, dna so we have uh, the dna that is found inside the nucleus so this dna what it does is that dna is the one that forms rna that is the ribonucleic acid by the process known as uh, transcription so transcription is the process by which dna is converted by which dna forms not converted dna forms rna 
by the process known as transcription. And then when this RNA, the, the ribose nucleic acid, the ribose nucleic acid that is formed, it is formed in three, in three forms. We have what we call the small R RNA, which is the ribosomal RNA, the one that helps in uh, uh, synth protein synthesis. Then the other one, it is uh, the mRNA, which is just the messenger RNA. This one, it acts as a messenger that transmits the message from the DNA to the newly synthesized protein. Then besides that, we have the tRNA, that is just the transfer RNA, the one that completes the trans the transferring all the genetic information from the DNA to the newly synthesized protein by the uh, ribosomal RNA. Then from there, RNA, it also forms what we call proteins by the process known as what? Translation. Um, so translation is the process by which RNA forms proteins. So these proteins, will, the protein that will, will be formed, it will have all the genetic codings from the DNA. Remember, DNA is stationary within the, uh, the, the nucleus. Hence, it cannot move out of the nucleus. But what it does is that it is able to send uh, its genetic information by the help of what? It has the ability to form RNA. And the RNA that the DNA forms, it comes in three formative. It comes in three forms. The first form is the ribosomal RNA that forms rib uh, proteins. The second form is the messenger RNA, the one that carries and transmit uh, and send the message from the DNA to the protein that are produced. Then the, the tRNA, it's the one that carries, it's the one that transfer all the genetic copy to form what we call duplicate and duplication. Yeah. Again, when the nucleus is dividing, we call that process as in karyokinesis. So there is karyokinesis is the division of the nucleus. Then the, also the cytoplasm does divide. So the division of the cytoplasm is what we call cytokinesis. It is called cytokinesis. Okay. So, okay, um, it is the site of ribosome formation and it forms ribosomal RNA, which becomes part of the ribosome, just like I was talking about. So the nucleus control the, cent the center, it controls the center of the cell because it contains the chromosomes, information that is carried through the chromosomes, which are, which are, in, uh, which are, a, form, which are a form of DNA. So let's look at the cytoplasm of the cytosol. Cytoplasm is a gel-like fluid inside the cell. It is surrounded by the organelle. It is, um, it is located in between the nucleus as well as the plasma membrane. Remember, the nucleus, the plasma membrane, as well as the cytosol, these are what makes up what we call protoplasm. So it is um, the medium for chemical reaction. It also provides the platform upon which other organelles can operate within the cell. The cytosol is a watery portion of the cytoplasm, and many chemical reactions take place within the cytoplasm because it contains organelles. All right. All the function, all the function for the cell expansion, growth and replication are carried out in the cytoplasm of the cell. Within the cytoplasm, the material moves by diffusion. Diffusion refers to the movement of um, molecules. Now, check. Diffusion is just the movement of particles, not necessarily the molecules. It's the movement of particles from um, an area of a higher concentration to an area of uh, lower concentration. So it is just a physical process that can work only for a short uh, distance. So that's just for diffusion. Then cytoplasmic organelles are little organs that are suspended in the cytoplasm of the cell. Each type of the organ has a definite structure and a specific role in the function of the cell. For example, we have the mitochondrion. 
ribosomes, endoprasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, as well as the rhizosomes. Okay, the rhizosomes, these are also found in tears. And that's it.